William Palmer was born in Wrigley, Staffordshire, as the sixth child among eight, born to Sarah and Joseph Palmer. Joseph, a sawyer by trade, passed away when William was just 12 years old, leaving Sarah with an inheritance of £70,000. At the age of 17, Palmer started his apprenticeship at a chemist's shop in Liverpool. However, his stint was short-lived, lasting only three months due to allegations of theft. Undeterred, he pursued a medical education in London and obtained his physician qualification in August 1846. Returning to Staffordshire later that same year, Palmer encountered George Abley, a plumber and glazier, at a local pub. He engaged Abley in a drinking contest, which ended tragically with Abley's death that evening. Though no concrete evidence linked Palmer to the incident, some locals noted his interest in Abley's wife. Back in Wrigley, Palmer set up a medical practice and married Anna Thornton, also known as Anna Brooks, in October 1847. Anna's mother, also named Anna Thornton, had inherited £8,000 following Colonel Brooks' suicide in 1834. The elder Thornton died shortly after staying with Palmer in 1849, fueling suspicions due to her financial ties to him. Palmer developed an affinity for horse racing and borrowed money from Leonard Bladen, whom he met at the races. Bladen's death at Palmer's house in May 1850 raised questions, especially when his possessions didn't match his recent winnings. Palmer's infant children frequently succumbed to convulsions, a common fate for infants at that time. These deaths attracted suspicion after Palmer's later conviction, leading to speculation about his motives. Facing mounting debts, Palmer turned to forging signatures and even took out life insurance policies on his family members. His wife's death was attributed to cholera, a prevalent pandemic in the United Kingdom. Amid debt and mounting pressure, Palmer tried to insure his brother Walter's life for an exorbitant amount but was unsuccessful. Walter's eventual death prompted investigations by the insurance company, revealing Palmer's attempts to insure others' lives as well. During this tumultuous period, Palmer engaged in an affair with his housemaid, Eliza Tharm, resulting in the birth of an illegitimate son. Struggling financially and with debts piling up, Palmer began contemplating the murder of his former friend, John Cook. John Parsons Cook, a frail young man who inherited a substantial fortune of £12,000, maintained a friendship with Palmer. Their association led them to attend the Shrewsbury Handicap Stakes in November 1855, during which they placed bets on various horses between the 13th and 15th. Cook's bet on Polestar brought him a £3,000 win, while Palmer incurred significant losses by backing the chicken. In celebration, they held a gathering at the Raven, a local tavern. Yet, on the 14th of November, Cook noticed a burning sensation in his throat after consuming gin, leading to Palmer's theatrical attempt to dismiss any suspicions regarding Cook's glass contents. Following this incident, Cook fell violently ill and confided in two friends, George Herring and Ishmael Fisher, suggesting that Palmer might have tampered with his drink. On November 15th, Palmer and Cook returned to Rugley, where Cook secured lodging at the Talbot Arms. Meanwhile, on November 14, Palmer received a letter from a creditor named Pratt, who threatened to approach Palmer's mother for repayment if he did not settle the debt promptly. The subsequent day, Palmer heavily wagered on a horse and suffered a loss. Despite seemingly recovering from his initial illness, Cook fell ill once more after sharing a drink with Palmer on November 17. Palmer assumed responsibility for Cook's health, and Cook's solicitor, Jeremiah Smith, sent a bottle of gin to Palmer, which Palmer had in his possession before passing it on. An episode ensued where chambermaid Elizabeth Mills consumed a sip of the gin and became ill, the remainder was given to Cook, exacerbating his vomiting. The following day, Palmer collected Cook's betting winnings amounting to £1,200. Subsequently, he obtained three grains of strychnine from Dr. Salt's practice, concealed them within two pills, and administered them to Cook. Cook's suffering continued until his death on November 21st around 1 a.m., as he cried out in agony that he was suffocating. On November 23rd, William Stevens, Cook's stepfather, arrived to represent the family's interests. 
Palmer informed him that Cook's betting books were lost, arguing their insignificance since all wagers become void after the gambler's demise. He also claimed Cook had outstanding bills amounting to £4,000. Upon Stephen's request, an inquest was granted. Simultaneously, Palmer acquired a death certificate from Dr. Bamford, an octogenarian, which attributed Cook's demise to apoplexy. A post-mortem examination was conducted on Cook's body at the Talbot Arms on November 26. The procedure was overseen by Dr. Harland and medical student Charles Devonshire and assistant Charles Newton carried it out. Palmer, however, disrupted the examination, inadvertently interfering with Newton and removing stomach contents in a jar for safekeeping. The jars were forwarded to Alfred Swain Taylor, who deemed the poor quality samples insufficient for analysis, prompting a second postmortem on November 29th. Postal Officer Samuel Cheshire intercepted correspondence addressed to the coroner on Palmer's behalf, resulting in Cheshire's subsequent conviction for mail tampering and a two-year prison sentence. Palmer himself wrote to the coroner, enclosing a £10 note, and requested a verdict of death by natural causes. Taylor found no definitive evidence of poison, yet he expressed his belief in Cook's poisoning. On December 15, the inquest jury delivered their verdict, stating that the deceased died of poison willfully administered to him by William Palmer. This verdict was legally permissible during inquests at the time. Palmer faced arrest on charges of murder and forgery after a creditor alerted the police to suspicions of Palmer forging his mother's signature. He was confined at Stafford Jail, where he initially threatened a hunger strike. However, upon being informed that this would lead to force feeding, he abandoned the idea. An Act of Parliament, the Central Criminal Court Act 1856, was enacted to permit Palmer's trial at the Old Bailey in London due to concerns that a fair jury could not be found in Staffordshire. Local newspapers had widely reported on the case and the deaths of Palmer's children, potentially impacting the impartiality of jurors. An alternate viewpoint suggests that Palmer was quite popular in Wrigley and might not have been found guilty by a Staffordshire jury. Some believe that the trial's location was moved for political reasons to ensure a guilty verdict. Lord Chief Justice Campbell, who presided over Palmer's trial, even hinted in his autobiography that Palmer might have been acquitted had the trial occurred at Stafford Assizes Court. The Home Secretary ordered the exhumation and re-examination of the bodies of Anna and Walter Palmer. While Walter's remains were too decomposed for analysis, Dr. Taylor found antimony in all of Anna's organs. Palmer's defense was led by Mr. Sergeant William Shee. However, the defense's position suffered criticism from the judge, as she personally asserted his belief in Palmer's innocence to the jury, violating professional conduct norms. The prosecution team, composed of Alexander Cockburn and John Walter Huddleston, displayed strong forensic prowess and compelling advocacy. They particularly discredited the testimony of defense witness Jeremiah Smith, who denied knowledge of Palmer's life insurance on his brother, despite his signature being on the application form. After the verdict, Palmer praised Coburn's cross-examination with a racing metaphor, it was the writing that did it. Circumstantial evidence emerged. Elizabeth Mills testified that, as Cook lay dying, he accused Palmer of murder. Charles Newton affirmed that he saw Palmer purchasing strychnine. Chemist Mr. Salt acknowledged selling strychnine to Palmer, believing it was intended to poison a dog. He also admitted failing to record the sale in his poisons book as required by law. Charles Roberts, another chemist, confessed to selling Palmer strychnine without proper record-keeping. Palmer's dire financial situation was explained by moneylender Thomas Pratt, who revealed lending money to Palmer at a steep 60% interest rate. The bank manager, Mr. Stobridge, confirmed that Palmer's account balance was a meager £9 as of November 3, 1855. The cause of Cook's death sparked intense debate, with both sides presenting medical witnesses. Many of these witnesses lacked experience in cases of strychnine poisoning, making their testimony appear weak by modern standards. Dr. Bamford's condition was precarious, and his diagnosis of brain congestion was dismissed by other witnesses. 
The prosecution argued that he had become mentally unreliable in his old age. The prosecution's witnesses, including Alfred Swain Taylor, attributed Cook's death to tetanus due to strychnine. She summarized his defense by arguing that if the prosecution's claims were correct, the poison should have been discovered. He called upon 15 medical witnesses to attest that the poison should have been detected in the stomach, the contents of which were missing from the post-mortem examination. In the closing arguments, the prosecution depicted Palmer as a desperate man needing money to evade debtor's prison, who then murdered his friend for financial gain and concealed his actions by tampering with the autopsy process. After deliberating for slightly over an hour, the jury rendered a guilty verdict. Lord Campbell pronounced the death sentence, prompting no reaction from Palmer. Around 30,000 spectators gathered at Stafford Prison on June 14, 1856, to witness the public execution of Palmer, administered by hangman George Smith. As he stepped onto the gallows, Palmer reportedly cast a gaze at the trapdoor and inquired, Are you sure it's safe? Prior to the end, the prison governor urged Palmer to confess his guilt, leading to the following exchange. Did Cook not perish from strychnine? Let's not engage in wordplay now, did you, or did you not, kill Cook? The Lord Chief Justice summarized on strychnine poisoning. Palmer was interred near the prison chapel in a grave treated with quicklime. Following his execution, Palmer's mother supposedly remarked, they have hanged my virtuous Billy. Shortly thereafter, a newspaper reported. It is reported that the rope that was used to hang Palmer is being sold in Lochmaben, Dumfrieshire, at a rate of five shillings per inch. The seller, originating from Dudley where Hangman Smith resides, seems to find eager buyers for this intriguing relic. The rope has also gained considerable popularity in England, and its production is reportedly increasing as demand rises. Certain scholars argue that the available evidence might have been insufficient to secure a conviction, suggesting that the judge's summation may have been prejudicial. On May 20, 1946, the Sentinel published an additional piece of evidence, not presented during the trial, discovered by Mrs. E. Smith, widow of the former coroner for Southwest London. This evidence consisted of a prescription for opium penned in Palmer's handwriting, with a chemist's bill for ten pence worth of strychnine and opium inscribed on the reverse side. 